Our first seminar of the year with Dr. Rippy Singh, who is the Chief Innovation and Strategic Coach at Inspiring Next. Uh, Rippy is a great friend of uh, C2E2, our, us, and I've known Rippy personally for almost 10 years now, Rippy, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, Rippy, uh, prior to starting Inspiring Next, Rippy had an, a very long and very successful career uh, Pat and Whitney and Alstom, and I think Alstom, you you started their solar concentrated solar program, right, Rippy? Right. And uh, so you're going to tell all, all all about this, but Rippy has a PhD from Indian Institute of Science, and he was actually a faculty member there before moving to United States. For those of you who don't know Indian Institute of Science, it's the best uh, technical university in India, and so great pedigree. So without further ado, the floor is yours, Rippy. I'm going to talk about purpose. Purpose both in context of us as individuals, as human beings, and purpose in context of whatever job you're doing right now or whatever job you aspire to do after you graduate from UConn. Yeah. Organizations have a purpose, business has a purpose. So wherever you go, think about the purpose of the entity you belong to, the purpose that you personally carry in your heart, in your head, that you are in pursuit, because that is key to your success. The subject uh, where I've known you for 10 years, but you probably have not heard me speak this particular topic before. So hopefully, hopefully it's gonna be something new and, and I'll, I'll take some feedback from you later on, later in the week. So my background, uh, Ur has mostly covered uh, whatever was important. More recently, uh, for the last about two years, I'm a part of uh, the expert group from US that is writing standards for innovation management, the ISO 56000. Uh, recently published a bunch of books on innovation. So that's uh, something more recent uh, in addition to the corporate career, the academic career, and uh, innovation coaching. Having said that, let's start. Okay. Some of the most commonly used phrases that you hear are, you know, you should have a goal in life. What's your objective? When you propose something, questions people will ask, what do you get out of it, right? What's in it for me? And there are things like, what does success look like? Think about it. All of these questions are around what, 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 what. I'll ask a question. What's the purpose here? And that question is more about why rather than what. And why is something really important? Simon Sinek has built his entire brand around one book which he published, which says start with the why. And he's given a whole bunch of uh, industry examples. Some of them I can agree with it. Some of them are not necessarily uh, relevant to what he proposes as start with the why. But anyway, start with the why is actually a good thing. And let me uh, also present to you a little bit what's the difference between purpose and objective. You can have multiple objectives. Purpose is usually all encompassing. It's larger than a single objective. It's, it's actually the meaningful end result of multiple objectives, of multiple goals. Okay? It's broader. Okay? It's usually far reaching. And the most important part with purpose is that you rarely achieve it. Objectives you can accomplish, you can achieve. Purpose is something that you're always in pursuit. An objective is mostly around what, and the purpose is mostly around why. And that's why I always ask a question. So what's the purpose? Yeah, we can define project objectives, we can define task objectives, contract objectives, and so, stuff like that. But in your life and in your career, think about why, think about the purpose. I want you to take 20 seconds, 30 seconds, because we, we don't have a lot of time over here, 
but I want you to scribble on a piece of paper in front of you three or four keywords. You know, crafting a statement of purpose will be hard. I don't want you to do that. That could take an hour. But throw in that piece of paper three or four keywords that you believe can help you define your purpose in life. Well, I hope you got at least a couple of keywords, if not more. Um, but we'll move on. And at the end of uh, my 40 minutes of lecture, I'm going to ask you the same question again. And hopefully, you will have a little bit more clarity in the next 40 minutes. So let's delve deeper into this. Does it even make sense to start with the why? Okay. Let's look at my personal career. I'll reflect a little bit over here. When I did my BS in engineering, I learned how to follow through solution steps given a problem and the solution is written in the books. There was no internet at that time. But you could go pick up the book, it's prescribed in it, I could follow it and solve the problem. During my MS, I learned how to solve a problem that may not have been solved before. And during PhD, I learned how to define a problem, how to explore a solution space. So all that was wonderful from engineering perspective. When I went to the business school, the MBAs, they taught me how to make money. Everything was all about profits. All, it was all about lean, efficiency, taking advantage of resources. It was all about how to exploit. But as an industry leader and as an innovation coach, I learned how to blend exploration with exploitation. I actually learned how to define a problem that is worth solving, how to define a meaningful problem. And that's why I say starting with the why makes sense. Many of us actually keep working for a long time and we are completely unaware of what the purpose is. We may not know. But then if you have gotten into the business rut and you've gotten into the typical American corporate style, you are all the time looking at money. If you're an engineer designing products, you're looking at life cycle cost. Okay, suddenly financial objectives become the so-called purpose. Really? No, those are still objectives. Financial should always be treated as an objective, not a purpose. Today, we are going through the fourth industrial revolution. I think we all know what that means. The first one was powered by steam, second one powered by electricity, third one powered by computers, and now fourth one is around cyber physical integration. And that creates a massive opportunity for us engineers in the R&D world because there are new digital disciplines that are creeping in. We can think of, you know, it started with five, seven, now it's down to some 20 such technologies, which are a part of industry 4.0 suite of technologies, you know, 3D printing, artificial intelligence, blockchain, digital twin, edge computing, augmented reality, IoT. This is all a portfolio of digital technologies, which together constitute the fourth industrial revolution. And a lot of us get very excited about developing these technologies, about application of these technologies to solve a problem. So you could say, you know, I'm so committed to artificial intelligence, that's what I want to do. In C2E2, we could talk about renewable energies and we could talk about smart grids and smart meters and smart batteries and everything smart. Smart means connected. Smart means it's got a feedback loop. It's got sensors that tell us, tell the system what to do. So perhaps technology could be a purpose. Advancing technology could be a purpose. Is that it? Can that be a purpose? Yes, it can be. 
But do we stop there? Why do we do all these technologies? We do all these technologies because we are thinking of smart homes, smart cities, smart infrastructure. We're thinking of factories of the future, smart factories, smart healthcare, everything smart. What does that mean? That means we are actually now beginning to talk about how technology will improve the quality of life. So we think about society, impacting society. That could be a purpose. So even when you are obsessed with technology, think about the application of technology and think about can the purpose be larger than just developing technology? You know, one of the things that uh, the Japanese talk about is around society five model. And that's all about using the technology for the benefit of society. All of the previous industrial revolutions have helped the society in some manner, but have also detached the society from certain value system. And people actually did not realize that they were going through the revolution. But this time, I think Germans and Japanese have come to say that we know we are going through a revolution. Let's put a little control around this revolution so that whatever technology we develop has a purpose. And that purpose should be serving humanity needs, serving social needs, serving us, not making us slaves of the technology, but technology that is still something that we can leverage for better health, better lifestyle, better whatever you think of. Is that it? Let me ask you this question. Now in society, we also collect stuff. We have precious stones. We all have our own stuff that we love, whether it's a house or a car or a phone or gold jewelry or whatever. And how do you keep that precious stone? If you have a piece of diamond, how will you preserve it? We all know how we preserve it. We keep it in the locker in the house or a locker in the bank, and we don't want to just carry it out very easily where it can be stolen. We preserve the things we love. Now, let me introduce you to the stone that is the most precious stone. And that's the planet. That's where we live. Okay. When I'm in a um, physical lecture, I carry hundreds of these with me and I give it to people and I say, hold it in your hand and ask yourself a question. If this is the most precious stone you have and there is only one of this kind and you inherited it from your grandparents and it's your job to hand it over to your grandchildren, how are you going to keep it? Are you going to just throw it around and bounce it off the ball? like a ball against the wall, or will you actually preserve it? You know, just because we can't see what's happening to this stone, we tend to forget that this is the only one that we have. So, is your purpose now around sustainability? Think about it for a few seconds. Think about it for a few seconds. What level is your purpose? Unaware? making money, pushing technology, helping society, or going all the way up to a sustainable planet, to a sustainable development. If this concept is new to you, follow me a little bit on the LinkedIn and over, over a few conversations, it will get clear, but it takes a little while to get to a point where we begin to realize that we are all trapped. We are actually mentally and physically trapped. And we are trapped on this place over here. We cannot leave this. There is no planet B. We must sustain this. Let's look at what is happening and why sustainability is a bigger issue than we think of. 
I hope many of you have heard the term Earth Overshoot Day. If you have not, you will know it today. Earth as a closed system has a certain biocapacity. Biocapacity means we have certain amount of productive land, forests, water, forests that convert carbon dioxide into oxygen, land and ocean that generate fish and crop for us. It has a capacity to sustain humans on the planet. And we as humans, we have an ecological footprint. We convert oxygen into carbon dioxide. We burn fossil fuel. We use livestock, we use fish, we use space for buildings and everything. So in some sense, we have a consumer that's human and we have a supplier that's the planet Earth. And we are all the time consuming the resources from the planet Earth. And Earth has a certain capacity to recreate those resources for us. The forests have a certain capacity to convert carbon dioxide into oxygen. Oceans have a certain capacity to generate fish. Land has a certain capacity to generate food for us, to prove animals that we eat as a food. So if you think of this as a, just like we talk about the annual budget of a company, or we talk about personal budget for the month or for the year, you have a revenue, and you have expenses. The Earth Overshoot Day is that date in the year when you run out of budget. Think about it, if it's a business, you have an annual budget and you must run throughout the entire year with your budget. And what happens when you run out of money? Every professor knows what happens to a project when we run out of money. Each one of us know what happens when we run out of money at the end of the month or halfway through the month. So that's the concept of Earth Overshoot Day. It is, are we consuming more than what Earth can support or are we consuming less? Am I under budget or am I over budget? This has been tracked for the last 50 years. And here is how it is trending. We are down as the planet Earth. We are down into July and August, which means we as humans run out of the budget that Earth has given us to live by end of July or August. Last year was July 29th. This year it happened to be August 22nd. You know why? It's been degrading all the time. Couple of times we had a good trend was whenever there was an economic recession. This year we had a massive uptick because of COVID. COVID has done to the planet so much good that all of our smart humans and smart leaders are not able to do. We are not able to maintain the ecological balance. In my humble opinion, this is not virus. This is nature fighting back and taking control and saying, you humans don't know how to live on this planet. I'm gonna take care of the planet myself. I'm gonna lock you up in your house so that you don't burn the fuel and don't generate that much carbon dioxide. I'm gonna make sure that you reduce your consumption and I need to get the control back. This is Earth's ecological system fighting back and telling humans that your economic system is not working. Let's look at countrywide, how does it go, okay? Think about worldwide, this year was August 22nd, USA is March 14th. USA consumed its share of resources by March 14th for the entire year. We stand here in March 14th, somewhere over here. And we need to go all the way back and dial this thing to a level where we can start saying, we are also responsible citizens. We have a real problem. And actually, if you look at all the countries over here, all developed countries are here. UAE, Canada, Denmark, Australia, Sweden, Singapore, Norway, Netherlands, Germany, Switzerland, every developed country is screwing up the planet more than it can, more than it should. And still we think we are a developed economy and we are all very educated and we have high technology. I am beginning to question our purpose behind technology. 
our purpose behind creating a consumer driven society, having four cars in a family of four, right? Having 40 to 60% wastage of food, just because we can afford to do it. Well, my friends, I'll tell you, we can afford to buy it, but we cannot afford to waste it. The garbage we are creating today is causing a lot of this problem. How do we move the date back? How do we get to a point where we can reverse this cycle of where we have pushed ourselves into March and I'm gonna go back so that I can have a sustainable planet? There are five major areas. The first one is energy. Fantastic, and I'm talking to the people who work with C2E to clean energy. So guys, give yourself a pat on the back. You are actually the single biggest contributor to helping recover the planet to where it needs to be. Okay. Uh, there, there are goals over here. I won't go into the details, but energy generation, population control, the choices we make on food, the way we make cities sustainable, and the way we deal with reforestation, conserving forests, and regenerative farming. There are all, and this is widely publicized. This is all available on the internet. Just search for Earth Overshoot Day. We can make changes to our daily life. We can make changes to our family life. We can make changes to how we live, how we work, how we travel. What businesses we do and how we run our business, we can be purpose driven and a purpose that supports our family and health and society, but also supports the planet. Okay. Of course, we, we all know examples that are coming out of people like Elon Musk, totally obsessed with sustainability. Okay. This is a major problem. Landfills at what cost? Even if Connecticut says that plastic bag, I'll charge you 10 cents, I tell you the cost of that plastic bag. 10 years from now or 50 years from now, when we have to recover it from the garbage is going to be heck of a lot more than 10 cents. We are still not charging or realizing the cost of a plastic bag. We talk about solar panels. I think you guys know, I don't know what's going to happen when we have all the landfills with solar panels that have lived their life for 20 years. United Nations has 17 sustainable development goals. Okay? all the way from some basic ones, no poverty, no hunger, good health, good education, gender equality, up to sustainable cities, responsible consumption, production, climate action, life on earth and underwater. I urge each one of you to look up sustainable development goals and think about which one, two, three of those can you actually help where can you change your lifestyle? Where can you drive your personal life as well as work, business, research to move the needle in the correct direction to get towards a sustainable development? Because US as a country, we are red or yellow on all 17 of them. We are not green. We have not achieved even a single sustainable development goals that has been allocated as our share, our responsibility that we need to do. Worldwide, we are number 31 out of 193 countries that currently have embraced these sustainable development goals. The initial set, it was not called sustainable, was given in the year 2000 that lasted 15 years and they made significant progress. The more recent ones were given in 2016 to go all the way up to 2030. So it's a 15 year plan and we are now into the year six and we are still not green on any one of those goals. And now United Nations is saying, we need to have a decade of action, what they call, you know, five years, we've not made significant progress, but in the next 10 years, we ought to do something. So guys, please look up and think about where you can contribute. Of course, so number seven is affordable clean energy, and you guys probably know, and you, some of your projects may already be aligned with that. But this one is still, according to this dashboard, significant challenges still remain. Now, we can always brush our, wash our hands by saying, well, I'm doing my best, I can't do anything else, it's the politicians, 
it's the system that's not supporting the utilities don't want it consumers don't want it well giving up is not an answer we just have to figure out how we communicate how we behave and how we refuse to do things which are purely driven by financial objectives the big boys wall street is changing its position now this is a beautiful thing right because we always tend to blame you know quarter to quarter results and uh, and how to keep the stock price up. Larry Fink, who is, uh, uh, I think he's a CEO of a BlackRock investment firm and that manages more than a trillion dollars of uh, people's 401k money. He said, we as investment firms are now too big to let the planet fail. Larry Fink says the people who are getting into workforce today will retire later in the century and will need to withdraw from their 401k in the 22nd century. And we must invest the 401k portfolio that will sustain that long. So they are beginning to say, if, if companies are not focused on sustainability, we will not invest in you. Okay, if the companies are not focused on sustainability, they will have difficult time raising money in the future. So this wave is coming. The executives are beginning to wake up to this realization that all what we have done in the last 30, 40 years is so-called trying to push the down numbers up, but not really good for a sustainable ecological system. And if the ecological system fails, the economic system is not going to survive anyways. So guys, if you're engineers and you're thinking of your job is in the product, you're designing power plants or designing fuel cells or whatever, solar cells, whatever product you're developing, be it a train or a car or something. And if you're focused on the technology piece and you're focused on product optimization, okay? Traditionally, you're thinking of cost of the product, operating cost of the product, life cycle cost of the product, great, all financial metrics. Think about user friendliness, comfort, safety. Yeah, we do that. Good, good, we do that. We still do that more from the marketing perspective. I want to make it user-friendly so it can sell. I want to make it safe so that I don't have liability, right? Okay, but I want you to also think about the ecological footprint, the ecological balance, the material life cycle. You know, when you think of a new product development, Ask yourself a question. Should sustainability be one of the objectives in the design? Or should sustainability be a constraint in the design? Or should it even be one of the disciplines in your multidisciplinary optimization? You know, perhaps you can start with that as a constraint. And I'm making a product, I don't want the product to have any negative impact on anything. But very soon you would realize that thinking of sustainability really is a discipline. And at some point you might consider that becoming one of the objectives because your purpose is larger and your purpose can have multiple objectives. And when you're thinking of financial objectives, think about sustainability as one of those objectives because purpose is encompassing of multiple objectives. Think about going from product life cycle cost to material life cycle cost. After the product has lived its life, where does it go? Can you repurpose, reuse, recycle? What can you do with it? What can you do with the material? How do you get the material back into the cycle? Think about a circular economy. The way Earth runs, and Earth has been around for four and a half billion years because Earth knows how to recycle everything whether it's oxygen or it's plants or it's animal or whatever, it knows how to convert everything back into a biological material really fast. But then when engineers came on this planet, we start using resources, we manufacture stuff, we consume it and we create garbage. And we don't close the loop back from the garbage to the resources very easily. We have to figure out a way to reduce the consumption of resources and to reduce the generation of waste. 
it is very possible that one company's waste is a resource for some, or some other business. We just never look at it that way. We never ask that question. We just think, I can afford to waste. You can afford to pay for the resources you're acquiring today. You cannot afford to clean up the waste once it goes beyond a point of no return. So think about circular economy. We generate more than 2 billion tons of waste annually. Okay, and 80% of it is going into landfill. We are recycling 13.5%. How do we call ourselves as a developed economy? How do we call ourselves as all these industrial revolutions? They are making life better for us? Absolutely, yes, but how long will that last? Not very long, if we keep going the way we are going. So guys, I'm gonna try and come closer to wrapping up uh, this conversation here, right? So I want you to think about, you know, you wanna take a screenshot of this, do it. Financial purpose, if you're in a business, simple scaling, let's open more offices, let's open more companies, let's create franchise, let's go buy other companies, strategic acquisition, refocus, all those are financial metrics financial objective. Then you can have technology objectives that can roll up to your purpose, technology purpose, whatever, uh, robotics and automation, additive manufacturing, cybersecurity, things like that. Or you could say, my purpose is around society. I want to focus on smart homes and smart energy and smart education and smart whatever. Whatever is smart you can think of, fill it out. Or you can say, my purpose is around sustainable development goals. I could pick one of these 17 here and do something with my life and career and job and move the needle in the correct direction. Now I want you to take 30 seconds here and pick three or four items from this chart that resonate with you. And then see if you can create a statement of purpose for yourself. Pick a few that resonate, that come to your heart, that are closest to you, and write it down. Now take those keywords and convert it into a statement of purpose. See if you can join it. See if you can combine them into something that you can write. Got it? All right, now here is a test whether what you got is truly from the heart or it was just something, you know. And if it's not from the heart, and that's okay, right? You can iterate on that, you can revise it, you can revisit it tomorrow, day after. We're gonna, we have recorded this lecture. I think, Terry, at some point we can, we can give all the attendees an access to this lecture one more time so they can revisit and see if they wanna you know, go through one more round of understanding what it means. So your purpose, the way you validate that, just like you know, as engineers, we, we run validation tests on every, every experiment. First question is, is this compelling enough to make you change your vacation plans? Second question, is there anything similar that you enjoyed during your middle school and early college? Actually, I asked the middle school and college to most uh, executives, but for you, is there something similar that you enjoyed doing when you were in middle school or high school? Third question, if you do not do this by the age 60, will you regret it? Would it be one of the things, oh, wish, I wish I had time to do this. I wish I had done that. Fourth, is this the most important thing to you other than family and health? And fifth one, do you actually have the competency and personality to successfully pursue it? The fifth one is not very important because you as students, you have enough time to develop that competency and to develop that personality. So don't worry about the fifth one. But the first three are the most important for you, three, four are the most important for you. If the answer to all of the following is yes, then you've got a good purpose statement. If the answer is no, then there is something missing. Then there is something you still need to up the game a little bit. Go back to the previous chart and see what you can so that's how you kind of develop a purpose. And it's okay, you know, 
Purpose changes in life. You can define something today. Five years from now, you might be smarter. You might have a better purpose. You might discover a different purpose. You know, another good thing that came out of COVID is a lot of people and a lot of companies realized that their purpose was wrong. They were in pursuit of something that really was not that meaningful. So many people have actually come to realization that they did not have a purpose or they had a purpose and it was misplaced. It was ill-defined and they're beginning to now relook at that. So there are life-changing events that can push you to change your purpose and it's okay. It's okay, but always make sure that whenever you change your purpose, you go up the ladder that we talked about, not downwards. Never ever give up on a social purpose for the sake of money. Never ever give up technology purpose for the sake of money, right? Do not go down the ladder. Go always try and climb up the model that we created. Uh, all of what I have taught you today has is uh, is in a book. I recently published uh, four books on innovation management, and the first one is around purpose. And each chapter defines in detail financial, technical, social, sustainability purpose. It's a lot of detail. It's available on Kindle. It's available on Amazon. Take a look if you need more information. Now, I'll close over here saying, you know, engineering school will teach you how to pursue a technology purpose. Business school will teach you how to pursue a financial purpose. School of living, that teaches you purpose around humans, around social issues. But the school of life, teaches your purpose around humanity, around sustainability. You know what? And once you choose a purposeful career, also live a purposeful life because there is only so much you can squeeze out of the planet, which is already beginning to, beginning to burst at its seams. That's my plea to you. Choose a purposeful career and live a purposeful life. Thank you, Terry and Ur.